Duchess Kate tries to get Harry and William back on track as photographers Sam and Zach Hussein look back at Princess Diana's favorite photographs on what would have been her 61st birthday. He's looking at um, he's looking at Diana, and he, you can just see that 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 the comfort she's given him, um, and this just such just just so genuine um, and very unusual for a royal to be um, to be that that tactile and, and show that kind of warmth. Prince Charles reportedly accepted bags full of cash as the judge denies Meghan Markle's request to dismiss Samantha Markle's defamation lawsuit. The biggest shame in all of this is as these lawsuits go forward, more and more sort of family secrets and drama comes out of the woodwork and it just makes for better headlines. And former royal household etiquette expert Micah Meyer helps us break down the most unusual royal protocols. I think it's it's like the little tiny tips and tricks like how the duchesses will both hold their handbags in their left hand so that each shake with the right hand, getting in and out of car correctly, um, you know, ascending or descending a staircase. It's those little tiny little tips that you don't even realize until suddenly you learn it and then you see it every time and you're like, I know this. We've got that plus so much more into Today is Royally Us. Hello to our fellow royal lovers and welcome to Royally Us. I'm Christina, that's Christine, and welcome to another big week of royal news. Queen Elizabeth stepped out not once, but twice in Scotland so far, so we got we had a lot to get to. There's so much going on. I know we just talked about it, but as we're kind of reviewing the week, it's like, oh yeah, a yeah. lot happened this week. Definitely. Well, before we get into it, let's see what you guys had to say about last week's show. And of course, it was a lot. Kicking off with Linda says, our queen organized and paid for the report into bullying. It is for her to decide when and if it would be made public. I think she is keeping her powder dry. Long live our beloved queen. Yeah, a lot of you guys had a lot to say about the investigation into the bullying allegations from Meghan Markle. You know, the sources told the Times last week that this report is going to be buried and we're not going to find uh, the findings. So, um, you know, I guess we'll never really know what happened. I know. Hopefully we can kind of, you know, close the door on that yeah. on that story and just hope that the parties involved, you know, came to an amicable solution. Definitely. Well, Lillian also had something to say about it. She said, I so agree that the report should not be published. Obviously, the results were not favorable towards Megan or the palace would have issued a statement. I guess. Well, you know, they did say that they were trying to keep the peace with mm -hmm. Harry and Meghan. So this is just their way of maybe like, all right, we're shutting, like you said, shutting the door, moving on. And we're not going to talk about this anymore. Exactly. I think there's so much speculation. And I know we said last week that you could read into the into the verbiage, you know, you can really pick that apart. But again, I think they're trying to like close the door, walk away. Yeah, move definitely on. move on. And Ernie says it's so disappointing that the two brothers couldn't get together for Lilibet's birthday. On top of that, their children would have had the chance to meet their cousins for the first time ever. Too bad. Well, hopefully, um, you know, maybe in the future, maybe they'll all get together. Who knows if they have Zoom calls together? Um, but, you know, we're going to get into more about this later, how Kate is trying to make the peace between the brothers. So hopefully there's a light at the end of this tunnel, but I don't know. <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, let's get into our Royal Roundup. And like we said, the Queen is in Scotland. The 96-year-old monarch traveled by Royal Train to Edinburgh and appeared for the historic ceremony of the Keys with Prince Andrew and his wife. Now, during the ceremony, the monarch handed the keys of the city of Edinburgh and welcomed um, and welcome to your ancient and hereditary kingdom of Scotland. Um, of course, again, on Tuesday morning, she um, attended the Army, the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force, where they pay tribute to the Queen as the head of the armed forces with a big parade and royal salute in the grounds of the Palace of Holyrood House. I love saying that Hollywood house. So, <laughs> fancy. Um, she's been met. She was met serving military personnel and cadets before being presented with the keys to Edinburgh Castle. It is so great to see her out and about. This has been her first public appearance since the Platinum Jubilee. And she seems to be um, in great spirits. She was wearing the Scottish color of Heather. Um, so she looks and she looks fantastic. She did. It was so nice. It just felt so normal to see yeah. her in her, you know, her coats and her big hats mm -hmm. um, at these very royal events that she would normally attend. I think it was a lot of us were sort of missing that consistency that we get from the queen, you know, the events that she does every year that we can look forward to. And this is one of them. Um, the week up at Hollywood house is, is, you know, an annual celebration, especially up in Scotland. I think it's, you know, when she's up at Balmoral, they don't really see her publicly, but she's mm -hmm. at Hollywood House. Um, it's more more of a sort of 
public, um, you know, an opportunity for the people of Scotland to see her. I should say. Yeah, definitely. And there's some more events going on this week. There will be a garden party attended by Prince Charles, um, an investor ceremony of Scottish people. Um, and she will also hold an audience with the first minister of Scotland. So it's unsure of how many more events um, she will be attending, but it's great to see her two days in a row looking fabulous. And, uh, you know, it, she's still walking with the cane, so, so she still has those mobility issues, but it doesn't seem to be holding her back this week. I know. And again, I think it's the, what they're doing, what the palace is doing is they're not announcing the uh, events that the queen will attend or right. not announcing her attendance. And it almost makes it better for us because if she canceled, we'd be really worried and disappointed. Yeah. But being surprised by her presence, it's it's more of a pleasant, you know, experience. Definitely. I love it. All right. Well, this is uh, this was a pleasant experience and some really fun photos. So back in November, Kate visited the Pride Bright Training Academy and we are getting our first look at these pictures. So during her time, she was with the 101 Operational Sustainment Brigade at Abigon Airfield to learn about how new recruits are serving personnel are trained. She shared on Instagram, today on Armed Forces Day, William and I would like to pay tribute to the brave men and women past and present, serving in all of our armed forces at sea, on land, and in the air, here in the UK and around the world. Thank you for all you thank you for all you and your family sacrifice to keep us safe. I love how she went like full top gun on this. I love it. <laughs> I know I love this. You know, the royal family has such a strong relationship with the military. And most members of the royal family have either served in the military or they're sort of, you know, have an official rank in a, within a military branch or organization. And so I think this is an inkling or a hint that we might see um, a role like that coming Kate's way soon, yeah. which I know a lot of people are really excited about. I love this so much. And I love all the photos. She looks like she's having the best time ever. It does look, so she always looks like she has so much fun when yeah. she's kind of out in the countryside, you know, getting a bit dirty and really like getting into it. I love it so much. Well, um, Kate and Prince William's first official joint portrait has also been revealed. The pair were on hand for the unveiling during a visit to the University of Cambridge's Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. The artist uh, who uh, made the painting said in a statement, it has been the most extraordinary privilege of my life to be chosen to paint this picture. I wanted to show their Royal Highness in a manner where they appeared both relaxed and approachable as well as elegant and dignified. So what did you think of this? I am. Um, I was really privileged. I obviously live in Cambridge. Yes. So, oh, that's much right. I got to see day. videos. I meant yes. to, you were there on hand. You got up close and personal to Kate. I did. I've had a busy week. I tell uh, you that. But, um, I did this past weekend go to the museum to the portrait. Mm -hmm. Um, it's beautiful. It's so well done. I think you have to see it in person because, it, especially where they've placed it in the museum, it sort of glows. It has this yeah. really ethereal lighting to it and it does have a very relatable a relaxed approachable feel to it and what I absolutely loved is how busy um the the area was I mean there's nothing else in this area except for this portrait um and it was just it was hard for me to get a picture of it because there were so many people and not just some people going up to see it but they were standing there for like five, 10 minutes, you know, or I would leave and come back and I'm like, oh my gosh, that woman's still there. Um, I mean, it's really captivating. I think people were really excited to see it. I love that. And what was it like getting up close to the Duchess? Uh, it, that was um, very exciting. It was, it was madness. And it was so interesting to see these Royal engagements sort of in real time and the way that they sort of move through these events was, was, was fascinating to see because they sort of move with a horde of people around them. Yeah. Uh, but my favorite part, and we'll sort of talk about this later towards the end, was seeing people after they had met the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and just how everyone was so honored and they just lit up and it was just, it was really powerful to see the effect that they had on people. Oh, definitely. I love that so much, so much fun. And I know that they had such a great time while in Cambridge, you know, Kate played soccer in her heels, which was too surprising <laughs> because she is so sporty, but it looked like it was a really fun time. It was, it was such a fun day and they did several really great things. They visited um, each, which is a children's hospice just outside of Cambridge. They visited a homeless charity. And a lot of these were sort of connecting to the last time they visited Cambridge, which was 10 years ago, actually. Wow. Um, and just sort of showcasing the longevity of their time as the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, the work that they've done with each, with homelessness, with Jimmy's, which is the homeless charity that they visited. Um, I, I felt like it, especially since, all of this started with that official portrait, which is a gift to the people of Cambridge. Um, 
I, it was such an interesting series of, of events. Yeah, definitely. I love that so much. All right, well, let's move on to Prince Charles because he addressed the shame of Britain's role in slavery in the opening speech at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda. So the Prince of Wales expressed his personal sorrow over slavery as he urged that we find new ways to acknowledge our past. Take a look at this. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. Um, so he also used his speech to reiterate the longstanding position that is up to members of the states if they want to move toward becoming a republic or, and drop the queen as head of state, which we've kind of seen on numerous uh, tours throughout the last few months. Yeah, this has been really interesting. I remember when William and Kate came back from their Caribbean tour and we were sort of saying, well, what is anything going to change? Like, what's it going to look like? This is a good example of things looking different, you know, following that feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think the Prince of Wales said in the speech that, you know, for years and years, we've seen um, different states and Commonwealth nations um, changing their role within the Commonwealth and changing that relationship. But he said sort of he's learned over the last 50 plus years that those relationships can change, but still stay um, beneficial for everybody. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. This is really a marked development in how the royal family is going to address those issues of the past, you know, the colonialism, the 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 racism that sort of has infiltrated their history. I thought it was really interesting to see this kind of, oh, this is a direct result of that conversation in the Caribbean. Definitely. I, and speaking of the Caribbean, Prince William did um, open up about um, his time in the Caribbean and what they learned. He said in a heartfelt speech on Windrush Day, he said, my family have been proud to celebrate this for decades, whether that be through support from my father on Windrush Day or more recently during my grandmother's platinum jubilee as people from all communities and backgrounds came together to acknowledge all that has changed over the past 70 years and look to the future. This is something that resonated with Catherine and me after our visit to the Caribbean earlier this year. Our trip was an opportunity to reflect and we learned so much, not just about the different issues that matter most to the people of the region, but also how the past weighs heavily on the present. So yeah, it definitely seems like they took that trip and learned a lot from it going forward and how they want to um, you know, approach these other different districts that may or may not want to be under the Commonwealth anymore. Right. And it's, it, I, I know we talked about it just weeks ago after the tour, we said it's going to be interesting to see what changes and develops. And I think, again, this is just an example of them sort of making those changes and developments and sort of saying whatever comes next, you know, I, I think that they're open to it. You know, they, I think they just want to keep the relationships healthy and yeah. beneficial for both countries. Definitely. Well, speaking of relationships, uh, trying to stay healthy, let's spill some royalty <laughs> and talk about William uh, and Harry and Kate, because it seems like she's doing her best to get the brothers back on track. A source tells us that there's a small glimpse of hope of saving the brothers from never speaking again. And that is Kate. She can sense that despite everything that has happened, William still feels the loss of Harry. She's been frantically trying to play peacemaker, but so far her efforts have proved unsuccessful. An insider tells us that she had a quiet word with the boys separately, even going as far as calling Harry in Montecito and suggesting that he reach out to William on his birthday. The issue is William and Harry are both overly stubborn, so there's not much hope. I feel like we get this, um, you know, kind of information every few months that the brothers are just not on good terms still. Other people say they are. I don't think we'll ever really know what's going on between them, but, you know, you hope for the sake of family that these two uh, do get back on track and hopefully Kate can be that mediator. Right. You do just want them. I think so many of us just want them to sort of work it out and be on better terms. And, you know, uh, because we've seen how close they were in the past and how, you know, important that relationship was to both of them. So it's hard to see them sort of, you know, in, in a fractured relationship now. Definitely. Yeah. Well, uh, a relationship uh, between siblings that definitely won't be getting back on track is Meghan Markle and her half sister, Samantha Markle. Now, this is all about this defamation lawsuit because Meghan attempted to dismiss it, but a judge denied her request. So Meghan argued against the claims that her sibling laid out in her marriage Heartless defamation case, uh, quote unquote, Megan alleged in her submission that Samantha deleted numerous specific factual allegations and exhibits from her original complaint, claiming that the facts would completely undermine Samantha's case. 
Well, in court documents obtained by Us Weekly, uh, it states that most obviously her original complaint attached to a 2018 email from Megan to the then communications secretary of Kensington Palace, Jason Knopf, that plaintiff alleged that the basis for the alleged allegedly defamatory statements in finding freedom. However, the email on its face disproved plaintiff's claim that Megan was somehow responsible for the author's allegedly defamatory statements in finding freedom. Um, in her motion, it continued that indeed her desperation to save her case, plaintiff quite literally fabricated one of the statements as evidenced by the missing interview transcript. Transcript. I mean, I don't. This was definitely not a win for Megan, since uh, yeah. this is definitely moving forward. She was also um, denied um, paying, or she requested for Samantha to pay attorney's fees. A judge denied that as well. Um, they were attempted to move remove this judge from the case, but that was denied. And then a motion will continue on. Um, denied her motion on June 21st. So this is definitely still in the works. <laughs> I feel for Megan in a sense, because the judge just, everything was a no, you know, yeah. across the board, all of her requests were a no. I, I think the the biggest shame in all of this is as these lawsuits go forward, more and more sort of family secrets and drama comes out of the woodwork and it just makes for better headlines. And I feel for Megan because I'm sure she wants these problems either to A, go away or B, at least, you know, be quiet and they won't. And I think that's the biggest shame about these lawsuits is that they just turn into, you know, more negative stories towards yeah. the suspects. Yeah, definitely. It's a, a circus nonstop. It really it, is. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, this is an interesting story. So Prince Charles reportedly accepted almost three million dollars in cash, which is was handed to him at his office in just bags, just bags full of cash. Um, this was from Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim bin Jabbar Al Tahani, the former prime minister of Qatar. And then this is all according to the Sunday Times. So the money was a donation to Charles's um, Prince of Wales charitable fund, which gives grants to other nonprofit groups that reflect the prince's interests. The sheet gave Charles three separate donations totaling 3.1 million over a period between 2011 and 2015. But the publication reports that there is no suggestion that the payments were illegal. So um, he, Charles's office released a statement saying charitable donations received from Sheikh Hamad bin Jassam were passed immediately to one of the prince's charities who carried out the appropriate governance and have assured us all assured us that all the correct um, processes were followed. Now, um, he faces the possibility of an investigation by the Charity Commission, the governing body of the Charity World of Britain. They said, we are aware of reports about donations received by the Prince of Wales's Charitable Foundation. We will review the information to determine whether this is any role for the commission in this matter. Now, this isn't the first time that his um, donations have been under fire or his charities have been under um, review, I guess. Yeah, it's it, it's so interesting. I just my mind is blown by someone handing you a bag full of a million a million pounds. What does that look like? <laughs> what does that even look like? Um, but I think that uh, charities are so strictly governed, especially in the UK. Um, there's strict protocols, lots and lots of rules and that and hoops that you have to jump through just to make sure that everything is above board and to leave no room for mishandling. So. Even the Prince of Wales is subjected to those really, really stringent regulations. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I can't uh, that bad. I mean, does it yeah. have a big dollar sign on right, it? Right, right. <laughs> it's like a big picture or like garbage bags. So right. like three, $3 million dollars in cash. That's a lot. So I don't know. All right. Well, in our Royal Miss History Moment of the Week, we're taking a look back at Princess Diana. On July 1st, she would have been 61. And we recently, a few months ago, caught up with photographer Sam Zach Hussein. Their father, Anwar, photographed Diana for years and they revealed which were her favorites. Take a look. When you were sitting down with your dad and going through these photos, what story really stood out to the both of you that he told? And does he have a favorite photo of Diana that he has taken? I think, yeah, uh, well, it was so many. What was interesting about it is we were going through this huge archive of pictures and we were, you know, we were very young for, for a lot of, um, I don't know that we were surrounded by these pictures, but you know, we were we were still quite young when Diana was first on the scene and um sort of the early years. So there's a lot that we didn't didn't really know. So we discovered so many amazing pictures. I remember finding some pictures that were in the exhibition of of Diana in Japan, and I had no idea she'd gone to Japan and just trying on all this traditional dress, all this traditional clothing in Japan. I thought, wow, this is amazing. So that was just, that was really fun. Um but we also found out, yeah, obviously a lot about 
what my dad experienced. I mean, we've spoken to him a lot over the years, but this, we heard a lot more. Um, and I think one thing that stood out for him, which is, um, I think, his favorite picture and also um, what well, Diana's favorite picture was a picture he took in um, Pakistan um, where she is cradling a a blind boy, I think it is, um, in, in Lahore at one of the hospitals there. Um, and even though the boy's, um, I think he's blind, he might have even been deaf as well, but you can just see he's, he's, he's looking at, um, he's looking at Diana and he, you can just see that, 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 the comfort she's given him um and this just such just just so genuine um and very unusual for a royal to be um to be that that tactile and, and show that kind of warmth um so i think and, and that's just a lovely picture and i think that's something that really resonates with him and that was just fascinating hearing about hearing about that and also that it was you know diana's favorite as well i love catching up with the royal photographers they have such a an amazing insight and um you know the, they they witness history on a daily basis they really do they really it's amazing i love listening to that the stories that they all tell are just always fascinating so fascinating all right well speaking of things that are fascinating it is time to break down the royal rules and joining us this week is former royal household etiquette expert micah meyer who is going to break down the most unusual royal protocols take a look what is the the one thing that everybody wants to learn when they come to you they're like what's the one thing that like really stands out and screams this is royal life I think it's it's like the little tiny tips and tricks, like how the duchesses will both they'll hold their handbags in their left hand so that they can shake with their right hand, getting in and out of car correctly, um, you know, ascending or descending a staircase. It's those little tiny little tips that you don't even realize until suddenly you learn it and then you see it every time. And you're like, I know this. Yeah. I'm sitting, of course, I created the term the duchess land, which is, you know, one of my terms I use in all my courses and just learning these little tips and techniques that make you feel and look polished mm -hmm. and knowing that you can do it and that you can use these at home. You don't have to be in a palace to use them. Definitely. What's the most unusual um, royal protocol, would you say? I would say the most unusual. Um, you know, I think, oh gosh, there's, there's so many. I would say, you know, I think when you come in, okay, here's one. When you're dining, if you're dining with the queen, for instance, when she puts down her spoon or fork, everyone should also follow suit. So that's one that if you didn't know that, if you didn't have the training, you would think, what is going to, what is everybody finished so fast? And the butlers are pulling away our trays and our, 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 you know, our plates. And so that's one I always think is quite fun that I teach my royal etiquette class. I love that. Is it true that the royal family, the women cannot wear stock or have to wear stockings, correct? And like nude fingernails, uh, paint, no colors and things like that. So it's actually, it's actually up to each Royal. So there's no rule that says they have to do this or they have to wear that. Mm -hmm. um, I think there, you know, the British culture generally does have some, you know, th there are some staples in the wardrobes that are more normal here than anywhere else in the world, but they trust the Royal family trusts the senior Royals to make their own fashion choices. Of course, they do have teams that supply all the things, lay everything out, suggest, but <clears throat> for instance, we used to see the Duchess of Sussex not wear, um, you know, pantyhose all the time. And that was her personal choice. And that was, you know, that was her. So you mentioned before about when the queen puts her fork and uh, knife down, everybody else has to be down. Are there any other rules and regulations when you're around the queen of the things that you should and should not do? Well, you know, interestingly, there's a big, there's all this controversy about Americans or previous American presidents or dignitaries or celebrities not bowing to or curtsying to the queen. But actually, as Americans, we don't need to, interestingly. So a handshake, you would, of course, wait until the queen extended her hand to you, but they don't, she doesn't require or expect mm -hmm. a curtsy or a bow. As Americans, we don't do that in our culture. Now, if you're a British celebrity or British politician, then a bow and a curtsy would be more, um, you know, ex more probably expected socially as a protocol. But um, I think, you know, one other funny thing is that people often don't know, but the Queen of England, she doesn't have a passport. I always think this is a fun I one. That. That a lot of people don't know. There's so many different little fun quirks and things. And she's, she's her own, I mean, she has her own country. This woman is, she doesn't need a passport. So, you know, I think that the whole protocol about not putting your back to her, not extending a handshake until she extends it to you, not talking to her until she talks to you. There's so many funny little 
quirks, but at the end of the day, it's just really to show respect to her. Oh, definitely. And it, it, isn't it true if she moves her bag from one hand to the other or something like that, she's ready to leave. But that's that's it. That's the the um, the event is done or something like that. So she has all sorts of little signals. I think once they're known publicly, though, she no longer uses them yes. because I feel like that would be she's so good about being discreet. And I think that would be the last thing she'd want is to hurt someone's feelings. So if that was true, then I don't think she any longer would would uh, use that little signal. That is different. What a cool thing to get into being a etiquette expert, a royal etiquette expert. I wish I knew more, you know, like I wish I was better at those sort of little etiquette things. I think it's so valuable. It really is. All right. Well, then now before we wrap up, time to check in on our pint size palace and Kate and husband, Prince William. Like we said, uh, they visited Cambridgeshire County Day. And as they strolled around the Newmarket race course, they met with locals, including, including Christine. And during the outing, the Duchess of Cambridge <laughs> spotted a baby and went over to say hello the royal mom of three asked to hold the four-month-old nora as she spoke to her mother um, who traveled from the netherlands to watch the races and kate told her i love babies but i'm sure prince william is like don't get any ideas about this i was so stressed (laughs) Um, i actually saw this woman right after this happened and she was wiping away happy tears it was really moving to see just how much um of a positive impact you know that was just like a quick moment of william and kate you know cooing over a cute baby but i think that woman is just going to remember that moment forever and four month old babies can be hard, you know, Mm -hmm. but I think that that moment was probably really, you know, really reassuring and fulfilling for her. I mean, it was just, I was so moved as a mom, knowing how special that must've been seeing her sort of wiping away these happy tears. I was like, Oh, no, it's so, and it's so true. Like you said, it's such a small moment out of uh, William and Kate's day, but it means the world to so many people. Exactly. And, uh, you know, it, it did. It probably made that woman's woman's life, you know, right. four, four <laughs> months old, you know, you're going through a really hard time. So it's right. nice that reassurance. It really is. So, all right. Thanks, Christine. That's it for this week's episode of Royally Us. For much more royal news, make sure you head on over to usmagazine.com. Keep commenting, keep subscribing, and we will see you guys next week. Hey everyone, I'm Christina Garibaldi, the host of Us Weekly Celebrity Coverage. Don't forget to hit subscribe for the latest celebrity news, tips, and video. And for much more content, make sure you head on over to usmagazine.com, the official home of Us Weekly Magazine.